Good morning. So good to be with you this morning. I hope everyone's doing well and looking forward to our study. Uh, We're going to be in the book of 1 Peter this morning. If you want to get out your Bibles and turn with me there. Um, Appreciate that song very much. That's actually one of my favorites. Uh, One of the first songs that I ever sat down with a song book and tried to make myself learn. uh, Because the words in it are just so wonderful, aren't they? Um, No waters can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. If Jesus is with us, we have nothing to be afraid of. Beautiful, beautiful message. Well, this morning, we're going to study uh, in 1 Peter, but really it's a topical study. Uh, Once a month, we've been talking about the gospel and trying to learn something about the gospel together. Uh, And so last week we started looking at uh, different ideas uh, that the world has about the gospel and about God that uh, causes them to reject the gospel. And we noticed how the gospel is actually a wonderful answer to those ideas about, oh, it's too exclusive. You know, it, it, it segregates and it, it, it's too exclusive. There's only so, so many people who can believe the gospel, and it, and it should be more inclusive to all these different kinds of people that I believe are included, and, and really how all the beliefs in the world are exclusive, and they're excluding people who believe the gospel and what it really says. Uh, we, we went through that and talked about that and studied that. I hope that that was helpful to you. Uh, This morning, we're going to look at this idea that the world has that uh, we don't need the gospel because God's not real. Uh, The suffering that we see in the world makes it very clear that God's not real. He's not really around. If he were really uh, all-powerful and if he were really good, then there would be no suffering in the world. And so, therefore, we don't need the gospel because God's not real. When we bring up the idea of suffering in general, we're bringing up the idea of our need for salvation. That's why we bring, that's why we create movies, right? With all of these action, you know, bigger superheroes, they're going to come in and they're going to save us from tremendous suffering. Anytime we talk about suffering, we're really talking about our desire for someone to save us from suffering. And the world's answer is, we have to save ourselves. And that's not going so well, nor will it go well. In fact, the world has decided in order to save ourselves, we must get rid of religion and we must especially get rid of those Christians because Christians have made up a God that they believe is going to save them and no one else. And they look down on all of us while they do the same evil things that we're doing. Unfortunately, the world around us has taken Christianity and it's bundled it up. And it's included all of the New Age Christianity, which is Christianity that says you can do whatever you need to do to be the best you and to enjoy your best life right now, which is absolutely not the gospel. It includes all of that. And it includes all of the legalistic people who are extremely uh, zealous for their opinions and their beliefs and who create a system of laws by which they can then look down and judge everybody else. They include all of those people in that. And then they say, all Christianity is really the cause of our suffering. I mean, look at how these people live and look at how they act and look at how they judge. And, and they're the root of the problem. They're not the solution. Yet... If Christians believed the Bible and lived as Christ lived on the earth, there is no greater solution to all of the world's problems. It's sad. It's really sad when we talk to people about the Bible and we talk to people about suffering and they kind of turn against Christians But what are we supposed to do about that? How can we have any impact on anything? The gospel is the answer. The gospel explains how God has brought about hope. 
hope of salvation from suffering. God is not a mean, harsh God that desires to destroy and torment humanity. That's not who he is. That's not who he has ever been. Even throughout the Old Testament, that's not who he was. But in his goodness, he's allowed suffering. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read all of this text, and then we're going to look at two different sections of it. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the testing, tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. This is our text for this morning to study together and to consider suffering and to consider the gospel. First of all, I'd like for us to start with the end this morning. So we're going to study verses 10 through 12 at the beginning here uh, and think about how the gospel, I'm not getting, uh, the gospel is something that the prophets and the angels predicted and knew was coming. Evil and suffering uh, was something that was common throughout all of history. Ever since the Garden of Eden, there's been evil and suffering. And, and as a result of that, men have wondered, what is God going to do about this? So the doubts and the fears and the struggles of the world around us today are not new. It's something that's gone on for thousands of years. And what we read in verse 10 is these prophets who prophesied about the grace, they didn't know what was going to happen. And they're sitting there waiting for God to do something, waiting for God to help them. And there's this wonderful picture for us in the book of Habakkuk of one of the prophets doing this very thing. Waiting for God to do something. Waiting for God to act. Let's look at some texts in Habakkuk. If you remember the book of Habakkuk, it's a conversation between God's prophet and God. Let's read this together. This is, this is how the book starts off. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. You see the picture of the prophet's uh, society. There's evil all around, Lord. How long will you make me see this violence? How long before you'll act and do something to correct what's wrong with society? And God responds. But he doesn't respond in the way Habakkuk would expect. 
He says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if, if told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth, who seize dwellings not their own. Can you imagine being this prophet and saying, God, my society here in Israel is just getting more and more evil. There is no justice in this society. There is there's wickedness and nobody listens to your law. Nobody understands the good precepts and, and concepts that you've shared with them so that we can have a peaceful and good and just and, and a, a society that has less suffering. Nobody's following that. Lord, how long before you act? And God says, watch and see. I'm about to bring a mighty nation in to destroy. Well, that doesn't sound like a solution to my suffering at all, right? I mean, how does that fix the problem, Lord? I mean, that's just bringing on more suffering, you would think. Habakkuk would turn around and say, but Habakkuk acts with humility, recognizing that God is God and God knows better, but still voicing his confusion and his doubt in this situation. He says, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. He points that out. You're not evil, so you wouldn't do anything evil. But why would you idly look at traitors? People around me are are betraying you and, and becoming traitors among their own people. And remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. He's got this comparison system. You look at the Chaldeans. And you look at us. Now, we're not, we're not that righteous, but certainly we're more righteous than the Chaldeans. Lord, I didn't want the Chaldeans to come and to prosper. That's even more confusing to me. How is that possible? And then he says at the, end of chap- uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand on my watch post and, and look and see like God commanded me to, and, and but also wait and listen to see if he'll give me an answer. And God's answer is, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end. It, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it's, no longer up, it's not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. God's response is, you can count on this happening. I can use this evil nation, the Chaldeans, to bring a judgment against this evil nation, my people. And I will do that. But to give Habakkuk some comfort, he he says, the righteous will live by his faith. In other words, the righteous will have to trust that I'm really good and that I will deliver on the promises that are hoped for in books like Isaiah and other prophets that I will restore the kingdom of Israel after I destroy them. They will have to rely on that. They will have to have trust and faith that I do what I say and that I am good. I'm all powerful and I could do things the way that you want to do things, but I will do things my way and I will accomplish what is good through the evil nation. And if you choose to put your faith in me and you choose not to walk in the ways of wickedness of the world around you then you will live god promises that that you will live and throughout the rest of chapter two he explains how he too will judge the chaldeans (laughs) chaldeans are not getting away with anything they also will be judged for their evil and we see that happening 70 years after israel was destroyed but then he says something else that's fascinating he says for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the lord as the waters cover the sea You see, God's not focusing on the here and now with Habakkuk. He's focusing on the long game. He's got something else in mind that he wants to accomplish. And that is the glorification of his own name, which will take place through the coming of Jesus and the reconciliation and the redemption of all mankind. And so Habakkuk, sitting there in his suffering, can't see the bigger picture nor can he see the eternal blessings that are awaiting him. He's just so focused on the here and now. And God says, 
my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, essentially. That's what the book of Habakkuk is about. And Habakkuk comes to accept that. It's beautiful as we study uh, that text together. But back in 1 Peter, you remember it said, these prophets who prophesied searched and inquired carefully, who's going to do this? And when's he going to come? Now, why are they doing that? Because life is full of suffering. You know, there's not anybody who suffered in the Old Testament more than the prophets. You know why the prophets suffered so much in the Old Testament? Because they were on God's side and they were enduring the suffering that God endures. The picture of the prophets suffering throughout the Old Testament is a picture of the pain and suffering that mankind puts God through. The heartache. The mental abuse that takes place in a rebellious and stubborn people who think that they're hiding things from God and doing things that are completely rebellious against God that that bring shame upon God's name as the nations around look at Israel and say, who are they? Look at how evil they are. They're worse than us in these ways. Well, all the prophets suffered, and they were told, wait with faith, for the day will come. Notice also it says that the angels were suffering. The angels were waiting. They were longing for that word here. They, the angels long to look is this idea of lusting. You know, the angels throughout time were helping with making the promises that uh, God had made. They were there when Abraham was made the promise. 1,500 years before Jesus came. Can you imagine being an angel and, and making the promise to Abraham and then sitting and waiting for that promise to be fulfilled? Waiting 1,500 years. And they're sitting there longing for that day to come. And apparently some doubted God. Some were carried off uh, and thrown into an eternal uh, place of judgment that, that was prepared for them and Satan. Uh, and so we read about that in Matthew. We read about that in Jude. We actually studied that a little bit this morning. Uh, Jesus talks about that place, and Jude also talks about that place. Why did they do that? Why did they somehow turn against God? Well, I could see it lining up with what's going on here. They doubt God's goodness. They doubt God's ability, his power. And so they say, well, I'm going to side with Satan. Maybe we can overthrow God. They're, they're rebelling against the, the authority that is over them. And they get away from the authority that they've been given and they serve themselves instead of serving God. But there's also an interesting picture in Luke when Jesus is born. And it's this picture of the angels seeing God's promises coming to fulfillment. And it's an amazing picture of angels singing and rejoicing over the fact that the Son has been born, the promises have come. I can't even imagine being an angel and living for 1,500 years. <laughs> but I imagine it would be tough to watch these foolish humans rebel against God over and over and over again. And you might start to question, God, do you really know what you're doing here? How could you be so patient with them? Look how evil they're being. You should just destroy them again, you know? I imagine I would be one that would constantly be like, you should be destroying them right now. Look at what they're doing. But now they see and they understand. They trusted and now they're rejoicing over the gospel, over the good news that was revealed to them. They hoped for it. And the hope was given a fuller revelation through Jesus. And the reality is something that we read about in verses 3 through 9. That there is a living hope. And the angels throughout the book of Revelation show us that they're witnessing it. They get to see it right now. They're living it. But we right now do not see it. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
from the dead. This idea that we have been born again to a living hope is fascinating, isn't it? Like, born again is this picture of a renewal, a transformation, a restoration. Born again to a living hope. That now, after the rebirth, we have a new future to look forward to, to consider, to think about. That the resurrection of Jesus has given us hope for our own resurrection. That's why it's a living hope. Our hope is not in someone who has died. That's every other religion in humanity. Their hope is in someone who has died. Our hope is in someone who lives. It is a living hope. That's an amazing idea, amazing thought that that Peter starts off with and shows to us that we are born again to a living hope. Then he describes the living hope. He describes it as an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Think about this idea a little bit. Everything around us, everything we see is perishable. And that's why we suffer. Why do we suffer? People don't live forever. Food doesn't last forever. Water gets polluted or runs out. Uh, Our houses get destroyed. The new car we buy immediately (laughs) has something fly off of a truck and crack our windshield or... uh, something fall on it or somebody hit it, something happens to remove the newness almost immediately and bring about our suffering. Can you imagine a world where that's not true? Can you imagine a tree that doesn't have seasons that produces fruits all the time? Can you imagine water that purifies itself? and is provided at all times. It's unbelievable. But that's the living hope that we have. Something imperishable, something unable to be defiled by human hands and our corruption, something unfading, it never loses its luster, its newness, and it's kept in a place where it can never be taken away. It's in heaven waiting for us. What a beautiful picture that is. That's what the gospel is offering to mankind. All of mankind have access to an inheritance that is eternal. The suffering argument makes no sense because the truth is God does have all the power to create a place where there's no suffering. He created it at the beginning of time and he has created it for us when this life is over. Life has suffering, but it's temporary. Notice he says that we are, we are by, by God's power, being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I know that suffering and trials make it hard. I know that the world around us is trying to fill our minds full of doubt that if God really loved us, he wouldn't let this happen to us. But God really does love us. And that's why he lets this happen to us. So that we can endure the trial and find protection throughout the trial and on the other side of the trial find The blessing. We as parents do this with our children. If we really love them, we would spank them when they are rebellious and defiant. I mean, we really would. We wouldn't want them to live a tragic life of rebellion against the authorities and end up in prison or in drugs or whatever it is. We would really give them a temporary suffering to prevent a longer suffering. That's the way we act. And that's what God does. And he says if we trust in him, he is with us. 
By his power, he is guarding us. Our faith is in him and he is with us throughout the trial. He does not forsake us. He does not abandon us. And the more faith we have, the more protection we will find. And also, the more faith we have, the more opportunities we'll find. I thought I had that on there. I didn't have that on there. The more faith we have, the more opportunities we'll find. Keep, continue reading this. It says, uh, so that the tested genuineness, okay, first of all, verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our suffering and having strong faith through the suffering, he says, is more valuable than gold that perishes through the fire. Our faith, if it's genuine, if it's real, and it goes through the suffering, and it endures and comes out the other side, is more valuable than anything on this earth. Because on the other side, we find, notice it, verse 7, the result of praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You, me, can find praise and glory and honor when Jesus comes. How? We endure the trials and sufferings of life with faith. We hold on to faith. We don't let it go. If we let go of faith, then we're vulnerable to losing praise, glory, and honor uh, when this life is over. But if we hold on to it, we have those things waiting for us. So instead of seeing trials as something that we wish we would never happen, which is what we do, and I understand We could actually rejoice over them, which is what he's telling us to do, because the outcome is a greater reward, greater praise for greater trials and greater faith in the trials. That's what's promised to us. That's what we're hoping for when Jesus returns. But there is going to be a temporary suffering that we will all have to do and go through in this life. Our salvation from suffering depends on our willingness to have faith. Our willingness to endure trials. It's not that you're saved from from your sins and then you're good to live your best life now. No. The gospel's not immediate. Jesus shows us. He lives a life of suffering and then there's glory. He's the author of and perfecter of our faith. We too will live a life of suffering, and then we will experience glory. We learned all about this in the Hebrews class. But you still might ask, why? Why must we suffer? Why must I go through whatever trial it is that God has given to me? When will it end? Can I... Can I Can I go over here and focus on something else so that it doesn't hurt so badly? Can I I appease my senses and my uh, carnal desires just a little bit to ease the suffering? Well, that's not what faith does. That's not a faith that's genuine. That's not a faith that is more valuable than gold that perishes. Genuine faith suffers and then receives glory. We need to understand that if our faith is not tested, it may not be genuine. I remember whenever I was first uh, first became a Christian, um, I had a lot of struggles trying to share my faith with people. Uh, It just did not work out well. Um, And it would have been easy to just say, this isn't worth it. Nobody else believes this. Why should I believe this? Why should I go through a life of of being alone in some ways with my family, with people that I was friends with? Why should I go through all of that? What's the point? But 
in the end, there's this explanation here. It's a trial. Is your faith going to be genuine or not? Are you going to hold true to the things that you have said you would hold true to? Yes, I know. Right now, you don't see the blessings. Right now, you don't see Jesus. But are you going to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, knowing that Jesus is real, that he lives in heaven that he sees everything that you're going through, that he loves you and he cares for you and he promises you tremendous blessings if you'll hold on to him. I like 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. You compare the suffering of 50 years with a trillion years of blessing and peace and eternal presence of God. It's light and momentary. It's light and momentary. So, if God is all-powerful and if he's good, why do we suffer? Well, we suffer because he gives us free will. In his goodness, he gives us free will. Having free will has resulted in rebellion and has resulted in suffering. It just is what it is. God created a world that was free from suffering and we didn't want it. We wanted more. And so that's what we get. But the gospel is this beautiful picture that promises a return to the garden, a removal of suffering, and all the momentary suffering that we endure in this life. If we endure it with faith, will result in glory when the Lord returns. So how do we apply this to ourselves? Well, I don't know what you're going through. I know what some of you are going through because you've told me. uh, But I don't know how that feels. I know what I've gone through. I know how that feels. And it is not easy. And there's temptations to give up, to doubt. But if we give up and we give in to the world, we lose the living hope. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then We shouldn't be doing all this, you know? But if he was raised from the dead, which I firmly believe he was, then it's worth everything that we go through. Because after this life is over, we know we will experience a life eternal. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on the Bible. Don't give up on the church. Don't give up on what God's plan is for you in this life. Instead, double down on your faith that God is good. He loves you. He's with you. He's all-powerful. And he will provide the eternal home for you if you will remain faithful to him. You can shine a light by doing this. For all others who are suffering around you to see that God is good so that they too can experience the eternal blessings that he's offering to them. That's what we're here for. If you choose to disbelieve God because of suffering, what hope do you have? That's not the answer. It doesn't help anything. All these people who say, I don't believe that there's a God because if he was good and if he was all powerful, there'd be no suffering. Oh, really? Okay, well, what hope do you offer me after this life is over? What hope do you offer me in this life? Temporary pleasures that go away with using? I mean, it's nothing. But the hope that God offers you is living. Hold on to that. No matter if everyone around you lets it go, hold on to that. I know I've gone a little bit over this morning. I hope that this helps you, though, as you deal with whatever trial you're going through I hope that you will renew your strength, renew your hope 
in a God who is good and who loves you and will provide every spiritual blessing when this life is over. He's made it clear and evident that he is able to fulfill his promises. We just need to believe that and put our faith in him. If there's anybody here who needs to respond to the invitation or if you need prayers for help, will you please come as we stand and as we sing?